Welcome to Beyond Dark Focus. I'm Stefan, this is Amanda, and this is Let's Palaver About the Wastelands. Door and Demon Part 2? Yes. So, technically, think Chapter 3 is where we're kind of at. Door and Demon Part 2. We'll be going from Part Peace, night, whatever you call this. What? Section. I just call it Section 19, all the way up to Book 2, Lud. A Heap of Broken Images. Dun, dun, and if you didn't recognize... Because you're an audio only listener. We have pie. pie. Because for us today is National Pie Day. So we decided, well, how better to celebrate than with some pie? And if you're going to have apple pie, you need a little vanilla ice cream with that. So we're really on top of that. So we're going to attempt to go through the book and eat pie at the same time. A little more difficult than some of the ones we've done. Okay, your ice cream is about to melt off the side of the plate. Guys, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Mm-mm-mm. Okay. Mm-mm, tasty. So, as in recap of last time, pretty much, um, Eddie was still very, very s skeptical about whether or not he could finish the key, to the point where he had an entire mental breakdown and almost shot Roland in the face. Yeah, that happened. That was the thing. <laughs> and so, finally, he decided to start working on it again, and... They make their way to a hill, and upon the hill they see the city, and they're like, between the city, where we need to go, and where we are, there's another one of those speaking circles. Which didn't turn out really well the last time, and now they know that Eddie, see upon seeing it said, that's where Jake's gonna come through it. And now we are there. <laughs> They went to bed, and now I've woken up the next day to go to the speaking circle. Uh, very, very early. Like, yes. Like four in the morning or something like that? Yeah, because Eddie really wanted to leave earlier, if possible. As early as possible. So we ended off on Roland waking Eddie up. Mm -hmm. And now we pick up with, it's time, Roland said. <laughs> Eddie set up, Susanna set up behind him, rubbing her palms over her face as Eddie... Eddie's head cleared. His mind was filled with urgency. Yes, let's go. And fast. He's getting close, isn't he? Very close. Do we still have enough time to get there? Barely. And you want to talk about barely. Eh? Woo! Like, Eddie, how do you know this? Yeah. Where, where, where did you get those psychic powers? Where did those come from? So pretty much it took them three minutes to get ready, and then they headed down, and an hour after that is when the first light of dawn began to touch the sky in the east. A rhythmic sound began far ahead of them. The sound of drums, Roland thought. Machinery, Eddie thought. Some huge piece of machinery. It's a heart, Susanna thought. Some huge, diseased, bleeding heart, and it's in that city where we have to go. Well, that, we won't get there in this chapter. No. So it's a nice little take on what each of them hears when this sound comes. It's like Roland hears the drums of war. Eddie still hears that machinery that he's been hearing this entire time. And Susanna's literally like, that city's diseased and we have to go there. Uh, Roland's right, though. Yeah. <laughs> it is drums. <laughs> but yes. the So it takes them two hours. Well, two hours later, the sound stopped. It suddenly had begun. And then the clouds roll in. So things are, things are kind of looking a little bleak as they start heading there. The circle of the standing stones lay less than five miles ahead now, gleaming in the shadowless light like the teeth of a fallen monster. Ba -dun -dun! I will say that especially this section or this chapter or whatever you want to call it, I love the descriptions. Like from beginning to end, as far as him describing how things look is just amazing. Like as it, and it just progresses as we move further in a hole. It's okay. It's okay, Stefan. It's not okay. <laughs> the pie is trying to escape. I will not let it. So, section 20, we have moved back to Jake. And he is still on his search in the city. Which he is, was met by young Eddie in a dream. Mm -hmm. And now he has to look for actual Eddie. And so he has found himself in front of a movie theater. Good old movie theater. All right, where are we at? 
let's see, Jake knew he shouldn't get moving, or should get moving. Three o'clock was almost here. But he paused a moment anyway, staring at the poster behind the dirty, cracked glass. Eastwood was wearing a Mexican syrup. A cigar was <laughs> clamped in his teeth, and he had thrown the one side of the syrup back over his shoulder to free his gun. The eyes were a pale, faded blue. Bombardier's eyes. It's not him, Jake thought, but it's almost him. It's the eyes, mostly. The eyes are almost the same. Huh. I wonder what we should picture Roland looking like. Well, based off the very first book, or... Based off any and every description we ever get of Roland. I mean, literally, if you look at the last book, they have Clint Eastwood on the front. (laughs) Yeah. Because that is very, very clearly who Roland modeled after. Yes. From descriptions, from pictures, from any and every single thing ever. Roland is very much modeled after Clint Eastwood. You let me drop, he said to the man in the old poster, the man who was not Roland. You let me die. What happens this time? Hey, kid, the blonde ticket seller called, making Jake start. You gonna come in, or are you just gonna stand there and talk to yourself? Not me, Jake said. I've already seen these two. He got moving again. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good at me. I'm not going to stop you. Keep going. Handle it. Turning left on Marquee Avenue. Once again, he waited for the feeling of remembering forward to seize him, but it didn't come. What am I looking for? What? Well, I know what you're looking for, Jake. (laughs) In the grand scheme of things, I know more than you do, so. This, This is true. So then from behind him, pretty much, it just says... Um, of course, she, he hears the girl scream, you give that back. And of course, Jake's like, oh, what did I do? What did I do? And then he, she, all he hears is, give it back, Henry. I'm not kidding. Jake turned and saw two boys, one at least 18, and the other a lot younger, 12 or 13. At the sight of the second boy, Jake's heart did something that felt like a loop-the-loop in his chest. The kid was wearing green corduroy, corduroys instead of madra shorts, but the yellow t-shirt was the same, and he had a battered old basketball under one arm. Although his back was to Jake, Jake knew he had found the boy from last night's dream. Eddie! Eddie! Little Eddie! Little Eddie. Little Eddie. Little, Much smaller than... Little innocent Eddie before life got a hold of him. And before needles got a hold of him. Before all the fancy drugs and everything got a hold of him. So before Henry got a hold of him? I think Henry already kind of held a hold of him. Before Balazar got a hold of him. Hmm. But moving forward. What other little noty notes do I have? Um, yeah. Jump for it. You have Henry teasing the girl. He had stolen her paper. Yes. And he was, he was holding it up. And she was jumping at it. He was holding it up. Doing what Henry would normally do. So pretty much it's just Henry being Henry, but I do like Jake's, well, Jake's description of him is, of course, accurate. He's like, he knew people, even at Piper, there was people like him. There's always going to be people like him. Hmm. And then, of course, she, of course, finally gets upset and just says, just like, you know what, keep it, that's fine. And he, of course, gives it back to her, and suddenly it's like, aww. It says, hey, what's the big deal? Henry sounded genuinely injured. It was just a joke. Besides, it only ripped in one place. You can still read it. Lighten up a little, why don't you? And that was right, too, Jake thought. Guys like this Henry always pushed even the most unfunny joke two steps too far, and then looked wounded and misunderstood when someone yelled at them. And it was always, what's the matter? And can't you take a joke? And it, why don't you lighten up a little? What are you doing with him, kid? Jake wondered. If you're on my side, what are you doing with a jerk like that? It's his brother. Yep. He idols him. He really does. He loves his brother. Even if his brother is just the, really the biggest loser I've ever seen in my life. 
So pretty much just by looking at them, Jake understands their brothers. They have similar, like some similar features and everything. And they turn to walk away and he's suddenly like, oh yeah, that's right. Oh my goodness. So he's like fumbling with his sunglasses and puts them on like that big. I don't know how that would have really helped the whole lot or not helped. Let's make myself look more suspicious instead of less suspicious. Hmm. Uh, this means close. Jake shrink inside. Yep. So they pass by good old Jake. He thought the younger one isn't supposed to remember me. He thought I don't know why exactly, but he's not. They passed him without so much as a glance. The the one Henry had called Eddie walked on the. Outside, dribbling the basketball along the gutter. You gotta admit, she looked funny, Henry said, was saying. Old Bebop, Mary, and jump in front of the newspaper. Woof, woof. Henry, Henry, Henry. You're just so, you're just a, just a pleasant fella. You're just so nice and pleasant and fun to be around. Eddie looked up at his brother with an expression that wanted to be reproachful. And then he gave up and dissolved into laughter. Jake saw the unconditional love in that upturned face and guessed that Eddie would forgive a lot of, a lot in his big brother before giving it up as a bad job. Yeah, he would. Beyond the building, two birds were currently passing a chain-link fence with an open gate in it. Beyond it, Jake saw was the playground to which he had dreamed last night. A version of it, anyway. It was surrounded by trees, and there was no odd subway kiosk with diagonal slashes of yellow and black across the front, but the cracked concrete was the same. So were the faded foul lines. Well, maybe, I don't know, Jake realized Henry was teasing again. Eddie didn't, didn't, though, he was too anxious about whatever it was he wanted to go, or wanted to, wanted to get, what, I'm, I'm horrible, <laughs> about whatever it was he wanted to go. Pretty much what had happened in that little bit in between is that Eddie was asking Henry if they could go somewhere. He's like, I really, you said we could go after school. And Henry's like, eh, maybe, maybe I don't know. And then he's like, let's let's shoot some hoops and think it over. I mean. Yeah, let's shoot some hoops. And and Henry will decide yes. if they were going to so go. So Eddie, Eddie pretty, really wants to go to this place but it's not right now it's not said where mm. so jake proceeds to watch the game that they're having yep which uh eddie takes off the overpants that he had the corduroys and has those shorts on that looks exactly like he was in yep. jake's dream oh is he wearing his shorty panties <laughs> ain't they cute good old henry good old henry that's not so good. No. But good old Henry. So pretty much, Jake watches the game, and Henry, Eddie pretty much schools Henry at first. Just like whips past him, shoots the hoop, it's perfect. And Jake immediately thinks, shouldn't have done that, Eddie. Because he knows, he knows the kind of person that Henry is. Mm-hmm. So it's like... He expected Henry to foul his brother, perhaps heavily, as a payback for the steal, but he had underestimated Eddie's guilt. Henry offered a head fake that wouldn't have fooled Jake's mother, but Eddie appeared to fall for it. Henry broke past him and drove for the basket, gaily traveling the ball most of the way. Jake was quite sure Eddie could have caught him easily and stolen the ball again, but instead of doing so, the kid hung back. Henry laid it up clumsily, and the ball bounced off the rim again. Eddie grabbed it and let it squirt through his fingers. Henry snatched it, turned it, and put it through the netless hoop. One up, Henry panted. Play to 12? Sure. Jake had seen enough. It would be close, but in the end, Henry would win. Eddie would see to it. It would do more than save him from getting lumped up. It would put Henry in a good mood, making him more agreeable to whatever Eddie wanted to do. Hey, Moose. I think your little brother has been playing you uh, like a fiddle. Uh, or like, uh, he says, like a violin. Mm. I like fiddle better. Has been playing you like a violin for a long time now. And you don't have the slightest idea, do you? 
No. No, he does not. Hmm. I love down here. He says, uh, soon Heaney was puffing like Charlie <laughs> the Choo Choo and going up, going up a steep hill. He would be a smoker because, of course, guys like Henry were always smokers. Yes, of course they were. The gateway drugged every, the, all the hardcore stuff. Good game, Henry, Eddie said. Not bad, Henry panted. You're still falling for the old head fake. Oh, I'm sure he is. Sure he is, Jake thought. I think he'll go on falling for it until he's gained about 80 pounds. Then you might get a surprise. I guess I am. Hey, Henry, can't we please go to look at the place? Yeah, why not? Let's do it. All right, Eddie yelled. There was a smacking sound of flesh on flesh. Probably Eddie giving his brother a high five. Boss. You go on up to the apartment. Tell Mom we'll be in by 4.30, quarter of five, but don't say any, anything about the mansion. She'd have a shit fit. She thinks it's haunted, too. Then, of course, you know, he suggests maybe we should tell her that we're going over to friend's, out, friend's house. And, of course, Henry actually does make a smart point. No, no, don't tell her that. She might actually call over there and see if we're there. Just tell him we're going to go get ice cream. The only smart thing that Henry's <laughs> ever said... And then ask him, hey, see if you can get a few bucks from yeah. mom, too. She won't, I need smokes. She, yeah, she won't give me any money. Not two days before payday. You can get it out of her. Go on now. Okay, but Jake didn't hear Eddie moving. Henry, what? Is the mansion haunted, do you think? Jake sidled a little closer to the playground. He didn't want to be noticed, but he strongly felt that he needed to hear this. Nah, they ain't no real haunted houses. Just in the movies. Oh, but I heard. <laughs> there was an unmistakable relief in Eddie's voice. But if there was one, Henry resumed, perhaps he didn't want his br little brother feeling too relieved. It'd be the mansion. I heard that a couple of years ago, two kids from Norwood Street went in there to bump uglies, and the cops found them with their throats cut and all the blood drained out of their bodies. But there wasn't any blood on them or around them. Get it? The blood was all gone. You joking? Eddie breathed. Nope, but that wasn't the worst thing. What was? Their hair was dead white. You know what? I don't I don't know how that's the worser of the two <laughs> things. Huh, white hair, no blood in your body. Hmm. I don't know, but as soon as I read that, like this entire, a whole bunch of pieces in this section or chapter remind me of it. Yeah. There's a little house in it. I've never read it. I just oh. know some stuff in the movie, okay? I'm just talking about the mansion, where mm -hmm. it's located, what it looks like, how it feels to people, the whole dead white hair, stuff like that. Because, um, which is funny, because isn't his name Henry in the movies, the bully? I don't remember. I could have swore it was. I've only seen it once. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing it again, and before chapter two comes out... I will see it again. I could have swore his name was Henry, too. But, Might have been. But, um... He's pretty off on that. When he survives the whole ordeal thing, his hair goes dead white, at least in the first... In, in the old movie. But, yeah. Their eyes were wide open and staring like they saw the most gross, awful thing in the world. You still want to go? Sure, as long as we don't, you know, have to go too close. Well, it is time to head off to the mansion. Because. And of course, Jake will follow. Because that's what Jake needs to do, is follow the guys. And so we've brought, come back to the gang looking at the speaking circle. Yep, they stood in the high grass at the edge of the Great Road, looking at the speaking ring. Stonehenge, Susanna thought, and shuddered. That's what it looks like, Stonehenge. Because, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good description. Everything they've described. Huh, Stonehenge is the... Are we saying that there's a speaking demon in Stonehenge that we can go find? That'll transport us if we make a, a door? <laughs> um, don't quite think, but... um. Uh. I, I love how he's... Pretty much. He's like, um, 
The circle enclosed was bare earth, littered here and there with white things. What are those? she asked in a low voice. Chips of stone? Look again. She did and saw that they were bones. The bones of small animals, maybe, she hoped. Yep. Uh, yeah. Eddie switched the sharpened stick to his left hand, dried the palms of his right on his shirt, and then switched back. He opened his mouth, but no sing, uh, sound came out of his dry throat. He cleared it and tried again. I think I'm supposed to go draw something in the dirt. Roland nodded. Now? Soon. He looked into Roland's face. There was something isn't there. Something we can't see. It's not here right now, Roland said, at least. I don't think it is, but I, but it will come. Our kef, our life force, will draw it. And, of course, it will be jealous of its place. Give me my gun back, Eddie. Yeah, it's a good time. You know, Roland, he's doing pretty well at this point. I think Roland can have his gun back. Yeah, he's, his, his mind's pretty clear. It's been, a, it's been a clear for a bit. Hmm. But, um, I like that, you know, Jake and everybody is, or Jake, young Eddie, whatever. They're all in an area where they're heading towards the mansion, this dark, haunted place. Yet, when Eddie, pretty much how Eddie describes the smell of it, is eerily enough exactly like an old house. He says, something lived in there, all right. He could smell it, a stench that made him think of damp plaster and moldering sofas and ancient mattresses rotting beneath half-liquid coats of mildew. It was familiar, that smell. So yes, he's, he's remembering how the mansion was. And it's just funny that he's doing this and his younger self is over there and he's just... Yeah. Uh, Roland buckled his gun belt, then bent to knot the tie down. He looked up at Susanna. As he did, we may need Denna Walker, he said. Is she around? That girl always around. Susanna winked, uh, wrinkled her nose. Uh... Good. One of us is going to have to protect Eddie while he does what he needs to do. The other is going to be so much useless baggage. This is a demon place. Demons are not human, but they are male and female, just the same. Sex is both their weapon and their weakness. No matter what the sex of the demon may be, it will go for Eddie to protect its place, to keep its place from being used by an outsider. Do you understand? I think she understands. <laughs> her eyes gleamed. There was an eye in the walker now. Both of them. I'll try to just jump ahead a little. Pretty yeah. much. She realizes there we that. Are. Yeah. yeah. If it's a girl demon, you get it. But if it's a boy demon, it's mine. That about right? Roland nodded. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, according to which sex this demon happens to be, what are you going to have to keep it occupied? So if you remember from the book, the first book, the orig- the demon ori- demon originally tried to draw Jake away mm-hmm. in the middle of the night, and when Roland found out, he's like, nope. But then Roland also found out he needed information, and the only way to get information from said demon was to have sex with it, and then pretty much say, hey, we're not doing this until I get some info, and then yeah. And but this is uh, essentially the demon cannot pass up free sex. It's like, oh, okay, okay, you, no, okay. So, they one of them has to be the distraction of the demon, while Eddie does what Eddie needs to do. <laughs> Which, at this point, all we know is he needs to draw something. Yes. Hmm. As they passed between the two tall stones into the speaking circle, it began to rain. Always. Always, it's the rain. The rain makes it all eerie and spooky. We talked okay. about this on another I was saying, I think we, we're very aware. Weather, very effective for ghosts, okay? Lightning and stuff, so they draw energy. That's how this guy's going to show up. We've Buffet. gone over this. Buffet. Go check out Unlucky in the Beyond. <laughs> as soon as Jake saw the place, he understood two things. First, that he had seen it before. In dreams so terrible, his conscious mind would not let him remember them. Second, that it was a place of death and murder and madness. It wants me, and I can't run away. It's death to go in, but it's madness not to. Because somewhere inside that place is a locked door. 
I have the key that will open it, and the only salvation I can hope for is on the other side. Yep. Yep. Yeah, very true. Very true. You've got to go in. So it pretty much That's gives the description place. of the outside of the mansion, which is, if you've seen any mm. of the It movies, it's exactly what you think it'd be. A crumbling old place with the windows and stuff boarded up or broken out and the condemned. <laughs> Just any any place you would think you don't want to go into. That, that That's <sighs> about it. The house was alive. He knew this, could feel its awareness reaching out from the boards and the slumbering roof, could feel it pouring in rivers from the black sockets of its windows. The idea of approaching that terrible place filled him with dismay. The idea of actually going inside filled, when, filled him with inarticulate horror? Inarticulate? Inarticulate? Horror? Yeah, he would have to. He could hear a low, slumberous buzzing in his ears, the sound of a beehive on a hot summer day, and for a moment he was afraid he might faint. He closed his eyes, and his voice filled his head. You must come, Jake. This is the path of the bean, the way of the tower, and in time of your drawing, and the time of your drawing, be true, stand, come to me. <clears throat> the fear didn't pass, but that terrible sense of impending panic did. <clears throat> it says, Eddie, it says uh, he opened his eyes again and saw that he was not the only one who had sensed the power and awakening sentience of the place. Eddie was trying to pull away from the fence. He turned toward Jake, who could see Eddie's eyes, wide and uneasy beneath his green headband. His big brother grabbed him and pushed him toward the rusty gate, but the gesture was too half-hearted to be much of a tease. However thick-headed he might be, Henry liked the mansion no better than Eddie did. So pretty much, it's like, no one wants to be there. No one wants to go no. there. It feels weird. It feels bad. Stay away. Says Jake suddenly remembered Eddie speaking in his dream. Remember, there's danger, though. Be careful and be quick. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a scary place. A lot of evil vibes coming off that place. Yeah. So pretty much, Eddie's like, can we go home? And of course, Henry's going to be like, you're a sissy. You're a sissy. Mm. But yeah, at the same time, he's like, see? He's walking away from it himself, like... Oh, neither. Neither <laughs> of them want to be there. <clears throat> Are you sure it's not really haunted, Eddie asked as they stepped onto the sidewalk. Well, I tell you what, Henry said, now that I've been out here again, I'm not really so sure. They passed directly behind Jake without looking him. Would, would you go in there, Eddie asked? Not for a million dollars, Henry replied promptly. How far do I have to go in? <laughs> and hey, then you are next, would you if? Would you go into the haunted house for a million dollars? If you were given a million dollars. There we go. Well, coming up within the next couple of sections, ask that question again, okay? Like you said, <laughs> how far do I have to go in? Well, as I said, ask that in a couple of sections. So pretty much, they, Eddie and Henry have now left the scene. They have wandered off. Yep, they're going home, Jake thought, and felt a wave of loneliness so strong he felt it would crush him. Going to eat supper and do homework and argue over which TV shows to watch and then go to bed. Henry may be bullying, uh, but they've got a life, those two, one that makes sense, and they're going back to it. I wonder if they have any idea how lucky they are. Eddie might, I suppose. It's debatable. Because <laughs> uh, it says... Because pretty much, I wonder if they have any idea of how lucky they are. And it, of course, talking about them going back to it and everything. And it's like, but Jake, Jake, Eddie, Eddie's not there right now. I mean, he's right there, but he's not right there. He's 
went through a rough yeah, time. <laughs> you don't quite understand. You, you're gonna be seeing, be seeing Annie soon. <laughs> So he has he crossed the street and goes to the house. Yep. And then we're back to the gang. Yes. So they have stepped into the speaking circle. Yep. Susanna sensed the movement in the empty grassland beyond the circle of standing stones. A sighing, whispering rush. Something's coming, she said tauntily. 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 That's a fun word. Coming fast. Be careful, Eddie said, but keep it off me. You understand? Keep it off me. I hear you, Eddie. Just do your own thing. Yeah. So pretty much he turns to Roland and is like, Roland, watch out for her. To which she's, I will if I can. I will if I can, Eddie. And it's like, it, it, it is a true statement, because you never know, but at the same time, it's like, not very reassuring. <laughs> There's a demon coming after us, okay? I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle it. Or... Well, then again, he kind of stopped. He said, Roland, watch out for her. I will if I can, Eddie, but keep it off me. Meaning, he's he's definitely, he's needing his space. <laughs> Jake's coming. Crazy little mother's really coming. So I think I think Eddie's had some doubts about Jake. Whether this little boy could really be doing all these things. Could be really oh. going through all of this. Oh, it's time. It, it, <laughs> it, it is time. Susanna could now see the grasses due north of the speaking ring, parting in a long, dark line, creating a furrow that lanced straight at the circle of the stones. Get ready, Roland said. It'll go for Eddie. One of us will have to ambush it. Susanna reared up her hunches like a snake coming out of the Hindu something basket. <laughs> uh, her hands rolled into hard brown fists, were held at the side of her face, her eyes blazing. I'm ready, she said, and then shouted, Come on, big boy. You come right now. Run like it's your birthday. <laughs> yeah, um... <laughs> The rain began to fall harder as the demon which lived here re-entered its circle in a booming rush. Susanna had just time to sense thick and merciless masculinity. So we've now answered the question, is it going to end up going for Roland or is it going to end up going for Susanna? <laughs> I don't know if it's going to end up going well, for either, either way, of them. Yeah. It's going for Eddie. <laughs> but which one's going to have to deal with it, we now know. It came to her as an eye-watering smell of gin and juniper and then shot toward the center of the circle. So yes, heading straight for Eddie. To which she flagged it down with her mind. <laughs> like, dude, I'm over here. I'm the one you want. And it, 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 it found her. Oh, yeah. All right. And we, we, we've got a little bit of a <laughs> her and the demon. So pretty much... It jumps at her, pins her down, and Eddie freaks out. His first reaction is, Susan, or Suze, Eddie shouted and began to get to his feet. And she's like, no, you do what you do, I got this. Says, Eddie looked uncertainly at Roland, who nodded. Eddie glanced at Susanna again, his eyes full of dark pain and darker fear, and then deliberately turned his back on both of them and fell to his knees again. He reached forward with the sharpened stick, which had become a makeshift pencil. Ignoring the cold rain falling on his arms and the back of his neck, the stick began to move, making lines and angles, creating a shape Roland knew at once. It was a door. Because how else would anyone come through? <laughs> we have a lot. Of, we, we have a very, you know, symbolic... For portal or symbol for portals in this world and it's a door it's a door other than knowing how jake originally got to this world yes. the first time because we never get a description of how he got there besides dying yeah yeah but he died but it still doesn't really explain why he came to this world or how he got to this yeah. world or anything else but every other time has been a doors door. I guess other than when he went back to his world, but then it was like back in the past, and it was just, it was a whole weird thing. It's weird because the he he just drops. 
But then again, he came into the world through death and then dropped out through death. So it's Well, like... did he drop out, though? Because we don't see him again until Roland goes back in the past before he came to his world and changes things. So technically, he just he actually just died. He didn't actually come back. Because technically, we go back in the past. Yeah. And he fixes things why Jake doesn't die, and that's how we're getting Jake now. Because he I didn't actually know. die, because he never came know. into the world. Jake's because Jake's mind was split in two. My mind is split in two. I can't do this. Time travel. Yes. Time travel. So, yes. Jake. Okay. But no. So, Jake has opened the gate and is walking towards the house. Mm-hmm. You're not really going in there, are you? A panic-stricken voice in his head had asked. And the answer that occurred to him seemed both totally nuts and perfectly reasonable. All things served the beam. And then, of course, no trespassing under penalty of law. And, or by order of NYC Housing Authority, this property is condemned. But let's go in. Well, you have to. Come on, come on. The very special door inside this... (laughs) This <laughs> Ooh, it's monster. This thing. This thing. It says, Jake paused at the foot of the steps, looking up at the door. He had heard voices in the vacant lot, and now he could hear them again. But this was a choir of the damned. A babble of insane threats and equally insane promises. Yet he thought it was all one voice. The voice of the house. The voice of some monstrous doorkeeper, roused from its long and peaceful sleep. And his first thought, of course, is maybe I should pull out the gun. And then it's like, what's that going to do? It's a house. Yeah. What is a gun going to do? <laughs> and said, uh, but here was another world, one ruled by some bleak being over whom guns could have no power. Be true, Jake. Stand. Okay, he said in a low, shaky voice. Okay, I'll try. But you better not drop me again. Slowly, he began to mount the porch steps. Twig is an interesting description of the house. As I said, the descriptions in this section alone are amazing. Like, I just love how he describes the house. What it looks like, what it feels like, all the little faces and everything else. And It's brilliant. I love it. (laughs) It reminds me of Monster House, too. But... (laughs) Did you ever watch Monster House? No. No. Oh, okay. Was it the animated movie? Yeah. Yeah, I never like watched the... it. I remember seeing a trailer for it, but I never watched it. It was actually pretty good. Um, he was so frightened that he no longer felt precisely real. He seemed to have become a character in someone else's bad dream. Hmm. Of course. He says, The evil choir, the evil presence, was behind this door. The sound of it seeped out like syrup. He yanked at the lower boards. They came free easily. Of course. It wants me to come in. It's hungry, and I'm supposed to be the main course. Yes. Yes, you are. (laughs) A snatch of poetry occurred to him suddenly. Something uh, Mrs. Avery had read to him. It was supposed to be about a plight of a modern man who was cut off from all his roots and traditions. But to Jake, it suddenly seemed like that man, that the man who had written that poem must have seen this house. I will show you something different from either your shadow in the morning striding behind you or your shadow in the evening rising to meet you. I will show you. I'll show you fear and a handful of dust. Jake muttered and put his hand on the doorknob. Hmm, why does that sound familiar? I don't remember. Was that the one of the little things at the very beginning? No, nope. that was literally the name of the... I oh, mean, it was like in the beginning, chapter? but yeah, it was the name of the first book. Book one, Jake, Fear and a Handful of Dust. That's interesting. I thought maybe one of the, per- the quotes, too. But yeah, it is one of the quotes. It's like one of the little poem things. So yes, the first book was called Fear, Fear and, and Little Dust. Dust. Which would explain why well, I don't know if they've mentioned it any if they've mentioned it prior to this, as far as <clears throat> like 
You know how movies, in movies, they say their name in the movie? Yeah. I'm trying to think if it, a handful of dust came up anywhere except right now. Otherwise, this would be that defining moment where he said the name of the movie. Well, that's two things back. We know they uh, some, they talk about The Wasteland, which is the name of the book. Yeah. yeah the Dark Tower is mentioned all the time. Yeah. So. That's my place. There it is. He closed his fingers around the silver key in his pocket, hoping the door was locked so he could use it. It wasn't. The hinges screamed and a flake of rust sifting down from their slowly revolving cylinders. As the door opened, the smell of decay struck Jake like a physical blow. Wet wood, spongy plaster, rotting... Laths? What the heck is a lath? I, d- I don't know. Okay, ancient stuffing. Below these smells was another. The smell of some beast lair. Ahead was a dank, shadowy hallway... To the left, a staircase pitched and yawned in crazy way into the upper shadows. So yeah, fun little... You gonna look up laugh? <laughs> but yeah, the, there's the bones. The bones are always nice. It's always good to have plenty of bones. I mean, that's very pleasant. Well, he, he's like, they, he assumed they were small animal bones, and then there was bigger bones, and he's like, you know what, I'm not gonna look at those. I'm not gonna um, hang on that too much. A thin, flat strip of wood, especially one of series, forming a foundation for the plaster of a wall, or the tiles of a roof, or made into a trellis or fence. I think I can picture what what he's talking about. Why doesn't someone stop me, he thought wildly. Why doesn't somebody passing on the sidewalk shout, Hey, you! You're not supposed to be up there. Can't you read? But he knew why. Pedestrians stuck uh, mostly to the other side of this street, and those who came near the house did not linger. Even if someone did happen to look, they wouldn't see me, because I'm not really here. For better or for worse, I've already left my world behind. I've started to cross over. His world is somewhere ahead. This, this was the hell between. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, That's a good definition. See... This is another part that reminds me of it. Because that was one of the main things that was brought up in the book, in both the movies, anything like that. Where bad things were happening, especially to these kids. And there would be adults that can't see it. It's like they're looking beyond it. They're looking past it. Like anytime anything ever happened, even if adult was watching it, it was like they were te- something inside their mind was telling them that... Oh, we'll just just ignore it. And like it's almost like it was beyond their focus. <laughs> Jake stepped into the corridor, and although he screamed when the door swung shut behind him with the sound of a mausoleum door being slammed, he wasn't surprised. Deep down, he wasn't surprised at all, and that's why I had mentioned it doesn't matter because he took one step inside and the door closed. <laughs> I can get back out that door. The windows are busted open. I can jump through a window. This is hell. This is the hell between. <laughs> we don't know that. Or 100%. We know what Jake said. Jake isn't the authority of what's real. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. So yes, the next section that we get is a description of Detta. How Detta was kind of used to th- certain things happening, being treated a different way when it came to sex and... Just pretty much like how she was always in control. And this was the first time while this demon is attacking her that she doesn't feel as in control as she should be or... And it scares her. Well, it is a demon. (laughs) Well, yes. And then pretty much, so she... And then of course she's seeing Eddie not doing anything. She's seeing Roland not doing anything. And of course she's starting... So like... Deep down inside, she knows they can't really do anything about it, but it still makes her mad. Like, she wants to hit them. She could just kick them and rip things off. But then Roland was with her. His strong hands were on her shoulders. And pretty much is like, you can't... If you fight this, you're going to die. So just relax and try to take control. And so she does. She's just like, you know what? That's right. This thing ain't gonna get the best of me. So... You can't do this to me if I'm doing this to you. And I'm not letting go. 
Pretty much. Yes. Don't fight. You can't win. If you fight, you only die. Sex is its weapon, Susanna. But it's also its weakness. Yes, it was always their weakness. The only difference was that this time she was going to have to give a little more. But maybe that was all right. Maybe in the end she would be able to make this invisible honky demon pay a little more. So yes, and then as she kind of turns the tide, the demon is like, whoa, 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 you, you're not supposed to be liking this. So tries to back off and she's like, eh, eh, eh. you're I'm not going a... anywhere. I got you, <laughs> you ain't. And does she ever have a demon? So pretty much Susanna has officially started her own war against this demon. Yeah, that's one way to put it. Yeah. Let's go with that. And pretty much it's like, I got this, but Eddie, you need to hurry up. Yeah. So we enter back to Jake, now inside the mansion. Yes, the creepy, terrible mansion. The problem Jake thought was simple. Somewhere in this dank, terrible place was a locked door. The right door. All he had to do was find it. But it was hard because he could feel the presence in the house gathering. The sound of those dissonant, gabbling voices were beginning to merge into one sound, a low, grating whisper, and it was approaching. Was it really approaching? <laughs> that seems scarier. Could you, you still want to go in there for a million dollars? I mean, if it is actually. Oh, there. okay. If it's not capitalized. That's what I was talking oh, about. Okay. You said it uh, was approaching, so I went with it. I know you didn't catch it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not as funny if you didn't catch it. <laughs> and Pennywise was approaching. <laughs> Come on. It's it. And it's Pennywise. <clears throat> oh, here's your fancy word. Something fell in his hair with a <laughs> flabby thump. Yes, the flabby thump. The flabby thump. Jake screamed in surprise, reached for it, and grasped something that felt like a soft, bristle-covered rubber ball. He pulled it free and saw it was a spider, its bloated body the color of a fresh bruise. Its eyes regarded him with stupid malevolence. Jake threw it against the wall. It broke open and splattered there, legs twitching feebly. I don't like spiders. I (laughs) I really don't like spiders. I like... I would have just jumped through the door. (laughs) I don't care if it's closed or not at that point. That is when we are gone. It's going to be like a cartoon or something you see and has the body print. I'm gone. (laughs) That's too much. It's okay. It's getting worse. Oh, I know. Another one dropped onto his neck. Jake felt a sudden painful bite just below the place where his hair stopped. He ran backward into the hall, tripped over the fallen banister, fell heavily, and felt the spider pop. Its innards, wet, feverish, and slippery, slid between his shoulder blades like warm egg yolk. Now he could see the other spiders in the kitchen doorway. Some hung on almost invisible silken threads like obscene plum bobs. Others simply dropped on the floor in a series of muddy plops and scuttered eagerly over to greet him. No. No and no and no and no and no. Just no. egg yolk. Oh. Egg yolk. <laughs> Just yeah, he was done. No, he was done too. He, he just was like, he, Jake flailed to his feet, still screaming. Yes. And ran, happened to run deeper into the house yeah. instead of leaving. He, he because tried. that that was the end of his bravery. Yeah. He that was would, done. That was his moment. That would have been my moment too. If I just saw a sudden spiders, if I had one of them just disintegrated and running down my body, if another one I had just thrown and it popped against a wall... I'd be done. Like you, I'd be out. I don't care about this journey anymore. I'll live with the voices in my head. It's good. It has to be good at that point. Uh, He looked forward again and came to a sudden skidding halt. Ahead, a pair of French doors stood half open and their receded tracks. Another hallway stretched beyond. At the end of the second corridor stood a closed door with a golden knob. Written across the door or perhaps carved into it, were two words. The boy. Yay! Below the doorknob 
was a filigreed silver plate in a keyhole. I found it, Jake thought fiercely. I finally found it. That's it. That's the door. Yeah. The boy. That That is your door. That's the one we're looking for right there. And then everything hits the fan. Oh, yeah. No, no. Just, this is sounds like, oh, it can't get any worse. And it gets worse. Because it, it gets worse. Well, this is that moment that you found the key item in the quest. And now it's boss battle time. Pretty much. Oh, God. Uh, they showed, uh, I've seen on Facebook pop a bunch of times. It was like, show Gandalf. It's like, oh, lots of healing items. And, <laughs> oh, and the autosave just went off. Must be time for a boss battle. That's how it always is. You, you, you can tell after playing enough games. It's like, oh, yeah. Yep, something's about to happen right here. It's kind of like watching enough horror movies. You <laughs> kind of predict where the, oh, there's about to be a jump scare. Yep, here it comes. Here, oh, there it was. Look at that. Well, literally, he has entered the building. He has kind of scared himself a little, did his looking around, his searching, and he's reached the little creatures, which were disgusting, gross, and all over him now. And he sees his goal right there. It's kind of like when you see the exit and you're like, hmm, that's where I need to go. And so you hop onto that other screen and suddenly everything freezes or the door slam around you or the little gate drops down and you're like, oh, shit. I never watched the movie, but I, I appreciated the commercial. Mm -hmm. I think it was for The Nun because they showed her like walking down a corridor yeah. and it's like, okay, we're about, and the music building in the commercial and it's like, Okay, okay, yeah, the demon thing, you saw it. It's yeah. Like, it, it turns, it shows her something, it turns back, and the demon's behind her, like, ah, there's a jump. And then she turns around, and then from the side of the screen, another one comes and attacks her. Like, whoa! Oh, that was good. That was good. I didn't expect it. Good job for you. See, good trailer, but, but apparently I heard the movie was horrible. Yeah, I heard the movie wasn't good. But I liked that scare. That was a good jump scare. It, was, it, it threw you off the scent only yeah. to have it come in a second later, which is perfect. Yes. Because it's it said you're focused on her right there, so either she's gonna do a vanishing thing and appear like pop up. Well, in the screen. it already appears. That's yeah. the thing. You see the you see the the nun first, yeah. or she sees the nun, and then a second nun or the same pops from the side of the screen. Like so, we, Jesus, that we already done. It was yeah. good, and it got every time Sandy saw it. it gets, <laughs> oh, it was great. So yes, he found his door. And things are about to get worse. Are they ever? God, are they ever going to get... Oh my God, they get worse. So yes. From behind him, a low groaning noise began as if the house was beginning to tear itself apart. Jake turned and looked back across the ballroom. The wall on the far side of the room had begun to swell outward, pushing the ancient couch ahead of it. The old wallpaper shuddered. The elves... Okay. The elves began to ripple and dance. Oh, that's right. There was elves on the walls. I was like, what? I thought maybe it was like eaves or something and I just wasn't reading it right. And then I forgot they had like the wallpaper and pictures and murals and stuff were elves. Oh. The elves began to ripple and dance. In places, the paper simply snapped upward in long curls like window shades which had been released too suddenly. The plaster bulged forward in a pregnant curve. From beneath it, Jake could hear dry snapping sounds as the lathing broke, rearranging itself into some new, as yet hidden shape, and still the sound increased. Only it was no longer precisely a groan. Now it sounded like a snarl. He stared, hypnotized, unable to pull his eyes away. Yeah, so the the house is officially taking some demonic form to try to attack him. Suddenly, Jake realized he was looking at a huge plastic face that was pushing itself out of the wall. It was like looking at someone who has, has walked headfirst into a wet sheet. So imagine every horror movie, mo every movie ever, where there's a face just coming. This one's not really coming through the wall. It kind of is it a wall? In a way, yes. Oh. <laughs> the, 
There was a loud snap as a chunk of broken lathe tore free of the rippling wall. It became the jagged pupil of one eye. Below it, the wall writhed into a snarling mouth filled with the jagged teeth. Jake could see fragments of wallpaper clinging to its lips and gums. Yeah, very, very pleasant. This yeah. is he is being attacked by yeah. the house, literally. Not spiders in the house, not anything else. The house itself is now forming and attacking. To which Jake's paralysis broke. He turned, lunged through the French doors, and pelted down the second length of the hallway. It is time to go. <laughs> the whole house now seemed alive. The air resounded with splintering wood and squ- squalling beams. The humming, insane voice of the doorkeeper was everywhere. Jake hand clo- Jake's hand closed on the key. As he brought it out, one of the notches caught in the pocket. His fingers, wet with sweat, slipped. The key fell to the floor, bounced, dropped through a crack between two warped boards, and disappeared. This is Murphy's Law at its finest. Okay. And literally every horror movie to ever exist. Oh, I desperately need this key or this anything right now. Of course I'm going to drop it. Jumanji. Except that kind of worked out for him in a way. Get it more specific. I don't remember in Jumanji. I mean, I the old Jumanji. Jumanji. The, the original Except, Jumanji. Wait, wait, I don't remember. At the end when he's like, he ha- he has the dice and he get they get knocked out of his hand. And, like, one of them falls and lands where he can see it, and then the other one just falls down and down and down. And And ends up landing on something good, or something to get to the end. And so then they pretty much give all uh, all hope up, and then they see his little piece moving, and he's like, do you have any last words? And he's like, Jumanji. What a great, great concept for a movie. That, I enjoy the new Jumanji. Yeah. It almost didn't still feel like Jumanji. No, it wasn't. It was not Jumanji. It was a a movie where people got sucked into a video game. Because Jumanji changed itself yeah. to be more modern for people. I'm like, uh, it was good, but it wasn't, it wasn't the old movie. No. It, it wasn't that movie. Because the pieces and the board game, and that, that was so unique. And s- not <sighs> only that, but that was a concept where... It, I guess technically it was a new concept. There's been so many different movies and stuff about people getting sucked into games or movies or anything like that. And Jumanji, especially when it came out, was about the game coming to life in their world. And it being not really realistic, but at the same time, like, you now have a lion in your house. And it's not like you suddenly know how to deal with it. It's like, no, this is a lion. In your house, and you're like, I'm gonna just shut the door. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> God, I love the old John, but more than anything, God, I love Robert Williams. Yeah. Robert Williams. Rest so in peace. <laughs> we miss you. But yes, he's in trouble. Susanna heard Eddie shout, but the sound of his voice was distant. She had plenty of trouble herself. Yes, yes, she did. She's going to be half melt that icicle. <laughs> oh. No, my geez. The rain was falling in sheets, threatening to turn the circle within the stones into a sea of mud. Hold something over the door, Eddie shouted. Don't let the rain wash it out. Roland snatched a glance at Susanna and saw she was still struggling. Um... Eddie turned his streaming face toward him. Did you hear me? He shouted. Get something over the door and do it now. So, Roland, Roland, Roland takes care of that. Roland yanks one of the hides from his pack and held the corners with each hand. Then stretched his arms out, leaned over Eddie and created a makeshift tent. The tip of Eddie's homemade pencil was caked with mud. He wiped it off. The door... Uh, it was not exactly the same size as the door on Jake's side of the barrier. The ratio was perhaps 0.75 to 1, but it would be big enough for Jake to come through, if the keys worked. If he even had a key, isn't that what you mean? He asked himself. Suppose he, dro- <laughs> he dropped it, or that house made him drop it. 
He drew a plate under the circle, which represented the doorknob, hesitated it, and then squiggled the familiar shape of the keyhole within it. He hesitated. There was one more thing. But what? It was hard to think of because it felt as if there were torna- a tornado roaming through roaming through his head. A tornado which random thoughts flipping around inside it instead of uprooting barns and pivots of chicken houses. Come on, sugar, Susanna cried from behind him. You weakening on me. What's the matter? I thought you was some kind of hot stud boy. Boy, that was it. Carefully, he wrote the boy across the top panel of the door, which the tip of with the tip of a stick. At the instant he finished the Y, the drawing changed. The circular circle of rain darkened. Earth, he had. I, I'm okay. doing terrible. All right. Anyway, the door came up. A real <laughs> door appeared. Uh, yes. It pretty much it. Pretty much kind of sinks, and then the door is there. It is no longer a drawing. It is a thing. It's a real door. A real door. A, a real, real door. door. <laughs> um, he looks through into his own world, into the house which he and Henry had gone to see in May of 1977. Unaware, except he, Eddie, had not been unaware. No, not totally unaware, even then, that a boy from another part of the city was following them. He saw a hallway. Jake was down on his hands and knees, tugging frantically at a board. Something was coming for him. Eddie could see it, but at the same time, he could not. It was as if part of his brain refused to see it, as if seeing it would lead to comprehension and comprehension to madness. Hurry up, Jake, he screamed to the keyhole. For Christ's sake, move it! Above the speaking ring, thunder ripped the sky like cannon fire, and the rain turned to hail. Because the rain wasn't bad enough. Now let's have hail coming down. For a moment after the key fell, Jake only stood where he was, staring down at the narrow crack between the boards. Incredibly, he felt sleepy. That shouldn't have happened, he thought. It's one thing too much. I can't go on with this, not one minute, not one single second longer. I'm going to curl up against the door instead. I'm going to go to sleep. Right away, all at once, and when it grabs me and pulls me toward its mouth, I'll never wake up. So there's that slight mental breakdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I dropped the key. I dropped my salvation. I dropped everything. <laughs> this is the end. I'm done for. Uh, then the thing coming out of the wall grunted, and when Jake looked up, his urge to give in vanished in a single stroke of terror. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe yeah. I don't want to be eaten by this thing after all. So pretty much, he throws himself to the ground, starts yanking at these boards. Meanwhile, the house is literally, parts of the house are forming body parts. Like, he, the thing has hands now that he's using to pry himself through. And it's just, this is not a good situation. You're at the end of a hallway. There is no way to go except through that door in that thing's mouth. You're done. These are the options. The door or the mouth, and you dropped the key to get through the door. Uh, It says, The doorkeeper saw Jake looking and seemed to grin. As it did, splinters of wood poked out of its wrinkling cheeks. It dragged itself forward through the dust-hazed ballroom, mouth opening and closing. Its great hand groped amid the ruins, feeling for purchase, and ripped one of the French doors at the end of the hall from its track. Jake screamed breathlessly and began to wrench at the board again. It wouldn't come, but the gunslinger's voice did. The other one, Jake. Try the other one. He let go of the board he had been yanking and grabbed the one on the other side of the crack. As he did, another voice spoke. He heard this one not in his head, but with his ears, and understood it was coming from the other side of the door. The door he had been looking for ever since the day he hadn't been run over in the street. Hurry up, Jake. When he yanked the other board, it came free so easily that he almost tumbled over backwards. I really thought I should have said, hurry up, Jake. For your father's sake, hurry up. (laughs) I think if it was Roland, it probably would have. I know, but still. I've heard it so many times, I can't even say for Christ's (laughs) sake anymore. (laughs) For your father's sake. But yes. 
And of course, then we get a small snippet of what's going on outside. So you have this house literally tearing itself Why apart. Why is this here? It's <laughs> so out of place. It's not even funny. Mine's like directly in between the two. Like, see? Maybe where Chris should have been. <laughs> not, might a little early. Jake's almost being by the house and we get this picture about the next chapter. Come on. But yes, so we get a small snippet of these women who happen to be walking by and they feel what feels like an earthquake and look over and the house is literally just collapsing in on itself. And they're like, you know what? It's fine. We're going to keep going. I keep going. <laughs> says, the door disappeared into it and then the whole house began to swallow itself from the outside in. The young woman suddenly broke the older one's grip. I am getting out of here, she said, and began to run up the street without looking back. Yeah. Peace out. I'm not. No, thank you. Yeah. So it's not something coming out of the house for sure. It literally is the house eating itself. So yeah. we're, we're good. Um, and we are uh, back to Jake. <laughs> uh, well, the thing's still doing its thing. And Jake finally getting a hold of the key. Jake <laughs> yanked his hand out of the hole in the floor and saw it was covered with huge trundling beetles. Ugh, it's not about spiders, though. Not, not quite as bad. He slapped it against the wall and knocked them off and cried out as the wall first opened and then tried to close around his wrist. <laughs> he yanked his hand free just in time, whirled and jammed the silver key into the hole of the plate. The plaster man roared again, but his voice was momentarily drowned out by the harmonic, harmonic shout which Jake recognized. He had heard... And in the vacant lot, but at the time had been quiet then. No, oh, but then had been quiet then, perhaps dreaming. He heard all the affirmation he needed in that voice. It was the voice of the rose. Oh. The plaster man's fingers crawled towards him like a, the legs of a huge spider. Oh, no, thank you. Jake turned the key and felt a sudden surge of power rush up his arm. He heard a heavy, muffled thump as the locked bolt inside withdrew. He seized the knob, turned it, and yanked the door open. It swung wide. Jake cried out in confused horror as he saw what lay behind. The doorway was blocked with earth from top to bottom and side to side. Roots poked out like bunches of wire worms seem seeming as confused as jake was himself so yeah um jake has his side open but the other side isn't open so all we have is just this wall of dirt except i believe right where the keyhole is you can see through the keyhole and that's it and it says it says uh, the keyhole shape remained for a moment, shedding a spot of misty white light on Jake's shirt. Beyond it, so close, so out of reach, he could hear rain and a muffled boom of thunder across an open sky. Then the keyhole shape was also blotted out, and gigantic plaster fingers curled around Jake's lower leg. So it's like you've gone all this way. You've tried, you've opened every single door a thousand times for it to be nothing. And you finally get the key. You finally find the door. And you know this is the door because the rose is singing to you. So you put it in. You unlock it. And you open it. And there's nothing. Well, I mean, there's dirt. There's something. But not without the something you need. No, you were expecting... Well, of course, he hears rain and stuff. But, I mean, you were expecting Roland's world. You were expecting the world your brain, your mind has been dying for. And it is, this is, it's not, it's not, you're this close, this close, and then something grabs you, and you're like, well. I tried. I really, really, really did. Eddie did not feel the sting of the hell as Roland dropped the hide, got to his feet, and ran to where Susanna lay. The gunslinger grabbed her beneath the arms and dragged her as gently and carefully as he could across to where Eddie cro- uh, crouched. Let it go when I tell you, Susanna. Roland shouted, do you understand? When I tell you. Eddie saw and heard none of this. He heard only Jake screaming faintly on the other side of the door. The time had come to use the key. He pulled it out of his shirt, slid it into the keyhole, 
he had drawn, he tried to turn it. The key would not turn. Not so much as a millimeter. Eddie lifted his face to the pelting hail, obvious to the ice balls which struck his forehead and cheeks and lips, leaving welts and red blotches. No, he howled. Oh, God, please, no. But there was no answer from God. Only another crash of thunder and streaks of lightning across the sky. Huh. Yeah, so Eddie's... Your key's not working, Eddie! Eddie's fear. His deepest fear this entire chapter. The fear that almost got Roland shot in the face has come true. (laughs) Not a big confidence boost there. Tell me. And so we get a small section of Jake fighting for his life. He mm-hmm. is literally playing Tarzan on, I think, a, a, what, a chandelier, yeah. a lamp, something. A lamp hanging from the ceiling. And he is swinging back and forth towards the thing. <laughs> he pendulumed back on the chain, struck the wall of packed earth, which blocked the doorway, then swung forward again. And he lost a sneaker. <laughs> mm. Eddie's terror and panic suddenly fell away. The cloak of coldness dropped over him. A cloak Roland of Gilead had worn many times. It was only armor. It was the only armor the true gunslinger possessed. And all, and all such a one needed. At the same moment, a voice spoke in his mind. He had been haunted by such a voice over the last three months. His mother's voice. Roland's voice, and of course, Henry's. But this one, he recognized with relief, was his own. And it was, at last, calm and rational and courageous. You saw the shape of the key in the fire. You saw it again in the wood. And both times, you saw it perfectly. Later on, you put a blindfold of fear over your eyes. Take it off, take it off, and look again. It may not be too late. Even now, uh, we we at the 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 twelfth hour. Yeah. Okay, there there you. Do. We need any little bit of hope that you have. Shake. If I I need like five minutes. You got five minutes. So he's ignoring Roland. He is ignoring Susanna. He says he pulled the wooden key out of the keyhole he had drawn out of the door, which was now real, and looked at it fixedly, trying to recapture the innocent delight he had sometimes known as a child, the delight of seeing a coherent shape hidden in senselessness. And there it was, the place he'd gone wrong, so clearly visible he couldn't understand how he'd missed it in the first place. I really must have been wearing a blindfold, he thought. It was the S shape at the end of the key, of course. The second curve was a bit too fat, just a tiny bit. Knife, he said, and held out his hand like a surgeon in an operating room. Roland slapped it into his palm without a word. Eddie gripped the top of the blade between the thumb and first finger of his right hand. He bent over the key, unmindful of the hail which pelted his unprotected neck, and the shape in the wood stood out more clearly stood out with its own lovely and undeniable reality. He scraped, once, delicately, a single silver sliver of ash, so thin it was almost transparent, curled up from the belly of the S-shape at the end of the key. On the other side of the door, Jake Chambers shrieked again. I don't know how clearly, I mean, we're talking about a sliver thinner than this piece of paper right here. That's what he missed. It's important. It's apparently, important. apparently. So yes, Jake is still hanging on, and then finally the chain breaks. It always has to break. Of course it does. You can't hold him forever. So he lands on the ground, and immediately the thing grabs him and just starts pulling him. And you're just like, this is everyone's horror. This is everyone's nightmare, right? How just to be eaten by a bunch of splintery wood, okay? Mm. And as Jake starts trying to claw his way away from this and yank his way out and yank and yank, his pants start coming down. So he kind of uses that to his advantage. He does. He does. He pulls one last time and the pants come off along with his other sneaker. Yes. And 
Luckily, the, <laughs> the thing seems to be distracted by that. It just seems to be of motion. So Jake pretty much gets lunged back. Like, he lunges back. The thing just shoves the jeans and stuff into its mouth and starts nomming. And Jake's just like, please, for the love of God, just please. <laughs> and he starts heading back to the door again. He had almost reached the door when the hand closed over his naked legs and began to pull him back once more. Now, let's also note that this isn't a monster. Like, it's not a beast of any kind. It's not a being dragged through the grass kind of scenario. This is made up of wood. Broken pieces of wood and rusty nails and mold and everything else. So when you have a half-naked kid being dragged across the floor, you can only imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. The shape was there now, finally all there. Eddie put the key back into the keyhole and applied pressure. For a moment, there was resistance, and then it resolved beneath his hand. He heard the locking mechanism turn, heard the bar pull back, felt the key crack in two. The moment it had served its purpose. Well, I guess it's very fragile. He grasped the dark, polished knob with both hands and pulled. There was a sense of great weight wheeling on the unseen pivot. Unseen. Unseen. Yeah, not unseen. Unseen. A feeling that his heart had been gifted with boundless strength and a clear knowledge of the two worlds had suddenly come in contact. And the way it opened between them. The door is open. Could you imagine if it had snapped before? Oh, crap. Wait, start whittling. Start whittling with the stick that you drew the door in. Is that Uh, how it works? As he looked through the doorway, he realized why. Uh, He felt a moment of dizziness and disorientation. And he looked through the doorway and realized why. Although he was looking down vertically... He was seeing horizontally. It was like a strange optical illusion created created with prisms and mirrors. Then he saw Jake being pulled backwards. Let me see. Where, where's our last picture? Because that, that's literally what he's seeing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that. And what a... Yeah, yeah, who knows if it shows up or not. But We can see it now. Oh, look at you. I forgot about that. <laughs> I forgot about that. You're right. And I, but I think that I don't think that's Eddie. Is that Eddie? I don't know. It's not how I picture like Eddie rolling. personally. It also looks like Jake has shoes in this. And also that door's a lot bigger than I think it's supposed to be. Yeah. Also, I mean, it's just it's a, it's, it's a it's an interpretation of what. It's still really cool. It's a really good picture. Oops, I apparently lost my page. Okay. That's the only one. Roland, Eddie shouted, Roland, it's got... Then he was knocked aside. So pretty much... Yep. Yeah. Roland picked Susanna up, put her in front of the door, and says, Let's go! <laughs> yep, yeah, so, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Roland grabs the demon and jumps into the door. Yeah. Because he... He's going to save Jake. He has a plan. Yep. He, he has I, a plan yep. he doesn't really tell anybody. He just grabs, he pretty much grabs Susanna, says, let go when I tell you. And then as soon as the door opens, it's like, we got this. I know what I'm doing. Yep. And the gunslinger staggered back. Uh, knock off his feet. Unseen wave of demon. Then rocked forward again with an un- armload of nothing. Clutched. Clutched it. He jumped through the doorway and was gone. With his handful of nothing. Yeah. The half-invisible demon. Jake heard confused shouts, then saw the gunslinger come through. He seemed to leap through as if he had come from above. His arms were held out, held far out in front of him, the tips of his fingers locked. Jake felt his head slide into the doorkeeper's m- Oh, feet. Whoop. Oh, jeez. I was like, you've, already, you've <laughs> killed him. You've killed him already. Jake felt his feet slide into the doorkeeper's mouth. Roland, he shrieked. Roland, help me. The gunslinger's hand parted and his arms were immediately thrown wide. He staggered backward. 
Jake felt serrated teeth touch his skin, ready to tear flesh and grind bone, and then something huge rushed over his head like a gust of wind. A moment later, the teeth were gone. The hand which had pinned his legs together relaxed. He heard an unearthly shriek of pain and surprise began to issue from the doorkeeper's dusty throat, and then it was muffled, crammed back. "'You came,' Jake shouted. "'You really came!' I came, yes. By the grace of the gods and the courage of my friends, I came. Yep, you came. You, you, you did come. You are using the demon to attack the house and be a distraction. But I don't even think it was that. I literally think he pretty much just shoved the demon into the monster's mouth. And yeah, kind of the same thing. Not really, because the demon didn't want to ta- attack it either. He- I'm not saying he did. He just threw the demon at the house, and he literally just- things are proceeding. <laughs> he pretty much just he threw a giant thing into the open mouth that was breathing in, and of course the thing reaches out. Roland shoots the hand, and it's like, nope. He needs his gun. Uh, Roland turned again and ran through the doorway. Although there was no visible barrier, he was stopped cold for a moment, as if an unseen meshwork had been drawn across the chair. (laughs) Sorry. Then he felt Eddie's hand in his hair, and he was yanked not forward, but upward. I laugh because, um... You... (laughs) We got an actual description of what happened to the demon... (laughs) It said, uh, behind them, the face of the doorkeeper had gone from white to a dingy purplish black as if it were choking on something, something which had been fleeing so rapidly that it had entered the monster's mouth and jammed in its gullet before it realized what it's doing. So, you thought the demon attacked. I thought Roland threw it at him, but really, it was just running and, like, kind of running and looking back and ran straight into its mouth and then choked it to death. (laughs) It was like a cartoon just happened. <laughs> well, it all worked out. The but, demon was a good distraction for the house. and uh, Some very interesting things happened with this demon. And the first demon Roland encountered. We'll get that to that in later books. They emerged into wet air and slackening hail like babies being born. Eddie was the midwife, as the gunslinger had told him he must be. He was sprawled forward on his chest and belly, his arms out of sight in the doorway, his hands clutching fistfuls of Roland's hair. It wasn't as easy to get back up through or through the door. So, essentially, Eddie just kind of has Roland by the hair. Yep. (sighs) So, he's pulling at his hair. He, of course, rips out some hair. (laughs) Well, I think once Susanna gets over there and starts helping, his hair rips and he loses some hair and she's got him by the head and <laughs> yanking him up by his head. And... and then, of course, Jake kind of slips out in between them and he gets out first, which gives more room to roll. Or no, Roland gets out and then that's able, Eddie's able to pull Jake up. And then, of course, Eddie's just like, I am relieved. He's laughing. He's crying at the same time. He's just kissing Susanna and it's just like... This is over. Thank God. Roland crawled away from the hole with his head down. His hair stood up on the wild wad. Though uh, threads of blood trickled down his cheek. Shut it, he grasped at Eddie. Shut it for your father's sake. Yeah, let's not give the thing time to change his mind about anything. Let, no, let's not let the demon, I'm pretty sure they described it had wings earlier. Let's not it escape the, 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 the gullet. No. If it, if it finds a way to unchoke itself, let's just... He's staying in there. Let's not let the, the house somehow get through the door either. So, yes. He shuts the door. Well, he like literally pulls the door and it just slams shut because <coughs> it's so heavy. And as soon as he's done, <coughs> dirt. Like all the doors. Once they're done, yeah. they're done. Where the keyhole had been, there was only a crude shape with a chunk of wood sticking out of it like the hilt of a sword from a stone. Susanna went to Jake and pulled him gently to a sitting position. You all right, sugar? He looked at her dazedly. Yes, I think so. Where is he? Where is the gunslinger? There's something I have to ask him. 
I'm here, Jake, Roland said. He got to his feet, drunk walked over to Jake, and hunkered beside him. He touched the boy's smooth cheek, almost unbelieving. You won't let me drop this time. No, Roland said, not this time, not ever again. But in the deepest darkness of his heart, he thought of the tower and wondered. Because you're Roland. Because you're Roland. Because as much as Roland loved the boy, Roland... Loves the tower? (laughs) More. The tower is his one true quest. Over anything, over everything, it is always the tower. So yes, the... Storm, now that the demon's gone and everything, the clouds, of course, have moved on by. Everything's starting to be fine now. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Mm-hmm. And, of course, he he wants to check on Susanna. Like, dude, are you okay? (laughs) Hmm. Henry's voice was gone. What's your name, Jake? Asked the woman. Because he's never met Susanna. (laughs) Well, he was suddenly aware that he had lost his pants in the struggle to escape the doorkeeper, and he had pulled the tail of his shirt down over his underwear. There wasn't very much left of her dress, either, as far as that went. Susanna Dean, she said. I already know your name. Susanna, Jake said thoughtfully. I don't suppose your father owns a railroad company, does he? Uh, No, no, he does not. He was a dentist. Yes. So if we don't... If you don't remember what that reference is, when we read, when he read Charlie the Choo Choo or pieces of Charlie the Choo Choo, Susanna was the name of the little girl who of the, the daughter of the director of mm-hmm. the company, who got a ride from Charlie the Choo Choo, and that's why, Charlie did so great. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hi, Jake. Eddie said, "Good to see you, man." Hi, Jake said, "I met you earlier today, but you were a lot younger then. I was a lot younger ten minutes ago." Are you okay? Uh, yes, Jake said. Yeah, before this whole ordeal, how the whole life, yeah. right? Well, this has been a rough time. I just, I just aged in the last ten minutes, okay? Uh, it was hard. <laughs> Some scratches, that's all. He looked around. You haven't found the train yet. This was not a question. Eddie and Susanna exchanged puzzled looks, but Roland only shook his head. No train. Are your voices gone? Roland nodded. All gone. Yours? Gone. I'm all together again. We both are. They looked at the same instant with the same impulse. As Roland swept Jake into his arms, the boy's unnatural self-possession broke and he began to cry. It was the exhausted, relieved weeping of a child who had been lost long, suffered much, and is finally safe again. As Roland's arm closed about his waist, Jake's own arm slipped about the gunslinger's neck and gripped like hoops of steel. I'll never leave you again, Roland said, and now his own tears came. I swear to you on the names of all my fathers, I'll never leave you again. Yet his heart, that silent, watchful, lifelong prisoner of Ka, received the words of this promise, not just with wonder, but but with with doubt. doubt. Let's keep overly instilling that. Yeah, Jake is saying things. I mean, uh, Roland is saying things, but... (laughs) We want to be honest with ourselves. Book two, Lud. A heap of broken images. Four, town and quartet. And that will be on the next one. Yeah, I don't know how far we'll read. I don't remember you know where the halfway point. Yeah, we didn't really look into that yet. No, we haven't. It's like right here. Oh. Bridge and City. Look at the next one. How many pages do we have? The Gill this time. So 220 to 270. 50 pages. That's a short one. That's a little bit shorter than the last one. Yeah, so 25 pages. So 45 will be roughly where we end up stopping. Which puts us right at 11. That works. So. So if you're reading along, we'll probably stop at election. Election. Election 11. Probably. Section 11. Maybe 12. Okay. It almost feels like it stops mid-sentence between <laughs> the end of it's 10 a, It's 11. called a cliffhanger, okay? 
a cliffhanger. So we, we, we may vary just slightly, but it'll be either be 10, 11, or 12. So read all of them. <laughs> just read the whole chapter. It's fine. Oh, I was trying to find 10. Yeah. 10's on the previous page, 12's on the next page. So we'll just decide which one. So that general area is where we'll stop next time. Somewhere in there. And that would be the end. We're, we're getting yeah. there. We're getting there. We're just speeding. Speeding. What, we're over halfway now? Yeah. I would assume so. It looks over. Uh, page of weird. We're at, what, like 220, and there's a total of mm. 420? Yeah. So, we're just barely over halfway. Barely. This book smells so good. <sighs> I love the smell of books. So, hope you enjoy. Hope you've been following along with us. Hope you enjoyed your pie. Your pie? Oh, the pie was good. The pie was good. The ice cream was yes. good. Together, they meld perfectly. Delicious. So, ah, uh, great chapter. Yes. We finally have the gang together. Ninety-five percent of the gang is together. Yes, ninety-five. We'll go we with 95. are so close, so close. The main group, though. Yes. Together, everyone. We're fi- We're kind of finally starting the journey. Yes. Finally. The drawing is now over. Yes, the drawing is done. No more drawing. We have. We already had the drawing of the three. The fourth has now been drawn. We're we're getting there. Well, uh, technically the third has been drawn. Techn- oh. oh, my God, I can't get Technically. It. Yes, the third, sorry. I was thinking four because that is the drawing of the, the three, three. And then I realized but that no one how you count the three, it's, it's a whole weird thing. But technically Jake is the third. Yes, because the Jack Mort wasn't really drawn. He was used. No. Unless you want to count Susanna and Dada to one. It's a whole thing. But technically the three have been drawn. We finally can get some cool interactions, even though the beginning of the last book was also awesome. Getting them together. Actually, I think it was this book I like. Mm-hmm. It was where they were learning, right? Yes. That was the beginning uh, of this book. Yeah. With Shardik. Shardik the Shardik Bear. the Bear. So, yeah, this is just a phenomenal book. Yes. Phenomenal book. God, it's good. So, we will uh, see give you it guys next time. Five out of five companion cubes. Yay! <sighs> Uh, we would give more, but, you know, we're not allowed. No, only five. Only five. We saved five. Five out of five, okay? It's good as it gets. I know. But I like companion cubes. They are great. They are awesome. Shouldn't we have another extra, just an extra one in case? No, 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 no extra companion cubes. No, okay. Only five allowed. Anyways, you can reach me at Stars and Travel. Reach a man at KZ Pup. Reach the show at Beyond Our Focus. On all social platforms, pretty much, and YouTube and podcast services. Uh, like the video if you enjoyed it at all. Throw a comment down below. Let us know what you're thinking of the books. Subscribe to the channel because that would also be awesome. Anything else? I think we got it. I think we got it. We got it. Okay. Now make sure that you have all your keys. And all your doors, and you get all your people on the same page before you go portal jumping. It's only possible. If you find one, let us know. Till next time, long days and pleasant nights. <laughs>